So imagine you could take all the hardware in your industrial IoT environment and make it smarter every day. So imagine that for a second. That you don't have to wait to make sure that your devices and your things are up to date with the latest software, the newest data, the best ideas from your developers and your engineers, that you can realize that real time from the developer to the device as quickly as possible. This is the idea that I want to share with you today, something I want to talk about. My name is Kit Merker. I'm a vice president of business development at JFrog. And um, I've kind of made it my career's work to make software updates better. And in fact, about a year ago, I, I coined a, a law, jokingly, um, which is basically if you're running software, it's out of date. And this is something that I feel passionately, passionately about, about fixing. I hope that someday uh, I'll be successful in making this law no longer true. But if you look across all of the mobile devices and all of the open source libraries and all of the cloud applications that we use, uh, it seems to be very true. And in fact, um, it seems to be very true in, in IoT today as well. And that's what I want to share with you. Now, before we get into IoT, I want to talk about uh, where software updates are probably at the state of the art. Okay, and that's in cloud computing. What we see at JFrog and what we've offered to our customers is this idea that you can use this technique called DevOps to keep your software up to date. And the big tech companies, the big internet tech companies like Google and Facebook, Microsoft, Twitter, et cetera, Snapchat, I mean, all these companies, they're able to deliver value from developers to end users rapidly with zero friction and a high confidence that that software will be reliable and available to those end users. They've kind of cracked the code for how to do this, if you will. And I want to share a couple of ideas about how that works and, uh, and what makes that work. And this is kind of behind the scenes in cloud computing. If you, if you think about it, no developer at Google is ever anxious that they're going to write code that's going to take down Google.com. Uh, they, they have a system and a set of tools in place that prevent them from breaking uh, the, the production systems, okay? And that's the big, the big thing that helps uh, you increase innovation and rapidly release software, is you need a system to help you. And it's beyond Agile. You can implement Agile with sticky notes and daily meetings to really get to the point of continuous updates with confidence to your end devices or your end uh, systems, you have to have the tools, and you have to have a trusted set of data that those tools can rely on. Okay? DevOps is basically just, simply just, software for building software. That's the, the best way to think about it. Okay, I want to share one technique that I find fundamental to making this process work in cloud computing, and we'll see if it translates to IoT a little bit. So um, you guys ever heard of this term before, pets versus cattle? Is this new for you? Okay, good. All right, exciting. Um, so in cloud computing, we have these two ideas of pets and cattle. Okay, now first, let me, let's use the metaphor. So excuse the metaphor, first of all. A pet is a member of your family that has a name that needs care and feeding. The cattle is kind of replaceable. There's a herd that's made up of all these interchangeable parts that are there to produce. You don't spend a bunch of, you know, one-on-one -on -one FaceTime with your cattle, uh, although your cat, you know, you might, um, you might love and want to spend time with. And you might, if it got sick, you might actually take your cat to be, you know, to the vet and to be, uh, treated, whereas with cattle, you might take a different approach to um, dealing with that. Uh, and you'd really want to isolate it from the rest of the herd and avoid this, okay? So when you think about how this translates to cloud computing, see my cat there? Um, when you have a pet in cloud computing, you have a piece of your software, a system that has a specific name that has to be updated and cared for and treated, and it fundamentally makes your systems less scalable. So anytime you have this singular, special snowflake part of your system, it makes it harder to make that system reliable and updatable, and ultimately is a single point of failure in your, in your process. Now, cattle, servers, clouds of servers that are replaceable actually change this entire process. And this is what makes rolling out a large-scale software update to the cloud fundamentally a reliable process and lets you do it very repeatedly and very regularly. And when there's a problem with that software update, you can easily change it out because it's only affecting one part of the system. And you're not affecting the entire system because you don't have this, this sort of singular uh, piece to it. Now, this idea sounds great in principle uh, for cloud, and it works very effectively. I mean, I'm telling you, like, insider secrets about how things work inside, of, uh, inside the cloud. But there's actually an interesting question, which is, how do you... Wait, 
How do you bring it to IoT pet devices? When you think about your IoT environment, all of these devices and things that you're working with are actually behaving as pets, or at least that's how we traditionally think about them. It's that they are physical devices that exist in the world, they may not be replaceable. And so we have to think about redundancy in a different way. Now I want to share with you some data that I've been collecting while we've been here. And Baruch's going to help me out here. I just, I think this is kind of interesting, so I just want to share it with you real quick. So did everybody, who here has actually put a sticker on this board? Did anyone? Well, these folks did. That's it? OK. Uh, so what we did is we put this up at our booth, and we basically are asking some questions about people who are here. So this is based, this is like real time reporting from people who are physically here. We asked, how often do you update your devices? So your IoT devices in your environment, how often are they updated? Once a year, once a month, once a day, once an hour, right, is this scale? Uh, and then how automated is the release? So completely manual at the bottom to completely automated. So from the time that you write the code until, uh, there's lots of push pin, <laughs> well, uh, littering. Uh, from the time you write the code to it gets to the device, how much human intervention is in there? And so what you can see here is that there's some clustering going on where we're really kind of in the annual to monthly frequency, right? And the level of automation, you know, there are some outliers up here that are really got the automation, but a lot of it kind of bunched up in this area. Now, if I ask the same question to a group of people who are deploying to cloud or mobile, they would be much more over here, right? They would be doing software releases very, very regularly, and they would also be doing them in a much more automated way. And so the question that I have is, how do we bring this idea of continuous updates and these techniques that we see in the cloud and apply them to IoT so we can get that level of confidence for the release. And um, I actually produced a short documentary, and I want to show you a clip of it. This is from a larger, a longer video. I'm just doing a very short portion of it that actually demonstrates some of this in action. So I'll take it away there. Let's watch this. I wanted to take what I learned about real smart buildings and scale it down to something that I could actually play with and update the software. I so I got to together with Josh DeWinner and Kelly Gruel at the Snowco Makerspace, and we actually so built the IoT so dollhouse. It's a complete working smart building in miniature that has an HVAC system, built the IoT dollhouse. It's a complete working smart building in miniature that has an HVAC system, a Raspberry Pi to control it, and even Wi-Fi. Uh, so red means hot, blue means cold. What kind of heater do you have in the house? What are you using for heating? We've got a couple of hair dryers that we've used to pipe heat. So this is uh, based on a Raspberry Pi 3, so it's running on Python. Who was the decorator who put the, all this uh, furniture in here? <laughs> we, we worked together. We were late night. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so when I was talking to Jason, and you know, he's he's telling us that you know these buildings to make them more efficient, a lot of times they'll use the different sensors, they'll use software to hook them together. Is that something we could try out with the with a software update? Sure. So let me just get into my code here. So I'm going to push this up to source control. Okay. Uh, our continuous integration pipeline will test it, produce a build. Uh, that deployable artifact will then get pushed to the Raspberry Pi. And, and then the system will give us monitoring data. So can you trip the, the motion? OK. Well, I'm already getting some warnings coming back here. So what, what do you think right. happened? So that was a here? threshold that was exceeded with the temperature, right? The temperature. And if it actually was a, a bad push, it will revert to a known good version before that. All right. Is that because of the, the server room supposed to be at server room. 60 degrees? We want to keep that one at a fixed temperature. Correct. I see. OK. So is yeah. that in your, did you have that accounted for in your code? Uh, apparently not. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Is there a way you can exclude the server room so we can just push it to the other rooms that are supposed to I only have motion sensors? I think I can do okay. that. Yep. All right. So we found a bug in the process. That's always interesting when that happens. Uh, <laughs> Luckily, and that this. never happens in software. Exactly, development. exactly. <laughs> it's always so funny that you know we want to we want to make sure we test before we release. Um, okay, so we, what's the story there, Josh? So, so indeed, we were watching for uh, uh, that that motion triggered heat to rise in the server room, which violates the rule that the server room shouldn't get hot. So now we've excluded the server room from motion detection, but the motion is still active in other parts of the building. Sure. See, in here we're not seeing any error messages. So that's great. Sure. Okay, so, so what do we just see happen there? So we had a di IoT dollhouse. I understand it's a contrived example, okay? But we had this system which had the HVAC system in it, the controller, the gateway, and we had the security system, right, which had the motion sensors, and we pushed a software update to make that environment better. Now, uh, we made a little mistake in there. We had a bug, which is we had some certain temperature rules, which were external to the software update, right? We didn't just do garbage in, garbage out, where whatever I push is just going to burn the building down. We had a monitoring system 
that could track when those changes were coming in. And when it violated a rule uh, in the, that was built into it, which said, hey, this server room can't go over this certain threshold, we're gonna roll the software back. And by building that into an automation pipeline, so not just automating the building, but also automating the process by which the building is updated, it makes it more resilient to human error, okay? If we can remove human error from the equation, then that means we can update more frequently. We can create a more reliable system that is gonna give you the consistency, confidence, security requirements you need in order to keep those systems up to date. So that's, that's what we're gonna talk about. So this is a basic DevOps flow that we use in cloud computing systems, software updates, continuous integration systems. You have your developers, they're submitting code into a Git uh, source repository. They use a CI system for automation like Jenkins, uh, which pushes their code into an artifact manager where you can store all of your binaries that have been produced. Um, binaries are basically just the machine readable version of your source code once they've been compiled. Uh, we do some security scanning and we want to push it out for distribution and that makes it to the cloud. Now if we add in the IoT systems to this diagram, it's exactly the same process, okay? The, the big difference is now we have to worry about distributing to a much broader set of, of destinations. It's not just one cloud deployment location or, or a small number of cloud deployment locations. We have to get to devices. So we do need to worry about sort of edge uh, network. And we can update, in we can coordinate the update between the cloud where the back end is happening. And it could be server, it could be private data center. I'm using cloud as a generic term. Uh, but the, the private uh, data center or the logic, the services, the APIs behind the scenes, and then the device management, whatever you're using for that, your gateway, and then ultimately the devices. And so having this framework for managing those updates, the pipeline for updates. Um, but then I wanna talk a little bit about, uh, I've, got a, I've got plenty of time actually, this is great. I wanna talk about a, a framework that we're using to kind of think about the trade-offs in, in updates, okay? And you'll, if you know me, you know that I love two by two matrix, matrices, the X, Y coordinates, because that's what all I do. So this matrix, um, there's two kind of ways to think about this. There's the update priority. Now on the one hand, you might have an update where you need to take it. It's a security patch, something that must go to the user right now. It's a very high priority update. It's a, you need to, if you don't update, you're gonna be at risk. And on the other extreme, you might be in a situation where you have low priority updates or that could cause uh, critical issues, a plane to fall out of the sky or your manufacturing plant to uh, explode or whatever. Um, and so this is kind of the first spectrum, right? In the middle is kind of your delight features that make people happier. And then the other side of it is how automated do you want it? How, how involved should the user be in deciding if this is a good time to take the update or should it just be forced on them, okay? So these are kind of the, the, the trade-offs. And it's not all equal. There's actually a, a safe zone in the middle, if you will. We have four different ways we think about this or, or names for it. I'll go through them. Um, so we have this idea of liquid software. This is sort of the ideal. It's the up and to the right category. It is updates that are needed and done in a way that's completely automated. And our belief at JFrog is that 90% of your updates should be liquid. And when we say liquid, it just means that it flows to the user. It's not something that has to be gated and controlled. And that could be to a cloud or to a mobile device or to an IoT device. In the uh, lower left corner, you still need this escape hatch where you have a high risk update in a risky situation and you wanna make sure that the user has the ability to, to update on their own terms. In the lower right cor uh, corner, you have procrastination, which is when, you know, you guys all have your phones up to date, right? You have the latest version, you're all running either Oreo or the latest version of iPhone. Uh, there's this procrastination that happens, right? Where we don't take the updates. Or, and uh, that, this is this kind of annoyance section where you're kind of, you know, snoozing your updates for a long time. And then in the upper left is the ethical quandary. This is where I'm pushing forcing updates to you in a situation that might be risky for you, that might actually cause you to, uh, to not, uh, not survive, let's say, not, not do well. Um, so if you have, uh, for example, a, uh, let's see, I've got the heart bleed uh, vulnerability, and actually I should have updated this because Equifax, right, that was the struts vulnerability, they didn't patch it, they procrastinated on the patching and lost 140 million people's worth of data. Um, this is a situation where you have a patch that's needed, but it's not being forced to the user, it's not being pushed into the environment, and so it's creating a risk, a serious risk to the, to the company. And on the other side, uh, you might have an example of an ethical quandary. You might have a car that's running software, and as we see, cars are running more and more software these days. Uh, I had a friend tell me a story about a particular car that uh, actually ran into this situation. So I've got a software update for the car, I'm forcing it on the user, and they can't drive the car while the software update's coming, and so, they basically uh, are now in a situation where they're potentially put at risk, right? They're 
they're you know, late at night, their kids are with them, they're stuck in this parking garage that's a little sketchy, and they have to wait while they download the update. Okay? It's not an ideal situation. And what I'd say is that the, the manufacturer, the software team there, fundamentally misunderstood the trade-off, right? They put them in a position where they either are saying this is more severe than it needs to be, and this should have been done in a way that could have been automated, uh, or they didn't understand the context of the user, and that the context they might be in, and they should have put the user more in control of that. Okay, so what I suggest is that what you want to do when you think about software updates is manage these trade-offs, okay? If you understand the trade-offs, you build a reliable system for releasing, you use data to help you drive those decisions about releasing, you can create software that can be updated into those devices and to the cloud in a way that's, that's um, much more magical than what maybe you have today. And um, just to share a little bit about what we're doing in this space for IoT, we've been serving customers in the cloud and mobile space, like I said, for, for a number of years. Uh, Artifactory, which is our flagship product, is kind of the leader in this category. We have over 4,000 enterprise customers across every segment you can imagine. And we're now taking this set of tools and we're bringing it to IoT, IoT solutions, and we're, it's what we're calling the JFrog platform for IoT. It's really not a new product, it's a new use case for us. And what we're trying to do is build a system that'll let you take your releases and pull them into this environment so that you can measure them, collaborate with other developers, and protect your business from risks and vulnerabilities, creating a consistent, secure, and reliable way to take your developer's software and magic and bring it to the devices uh, that you're running. And that is all I have. I hope that we prove Merker's law wrong. Thank you very much.